Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode five of Book Talk Today. We'll be joined by uh, author and former US Senate speechwriter Adam Lowenstein, where we'll be discussing his book, Reframe the Day. Um, Adam, it's great to have you on. Thank you so much for taking the time. I uh, really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So what I tend to do is I tend to start by asking a question in particular. And the one I wanted to ask you was, what was the day in the life of a U.S. Senate speechwriter like? The easy answer and the accurate answer would be to say that no two days were the same. Okay. And I think that was mostly true because a lot of what would be happening on any given day, a speech to a certain advocacy organization or a speech about a certain issue that was happening in the news, you know, those would inevitably change day to day, sometimes hour to hour, um, tweet to tweet, depending on where those tweets were coming from. But I think the main thing that characterized my time working in politics is just this constant incoming flow of information and stimuli and distractions. And there are obviously a lot of other aspects of working in politics that were much more fulfilling and meaningful. I was always surrounded by great people. And that's true even for most of the politicians themselves, despite how they're often um, caricatured on social media and on TV. But for the most part, the people who work in politics are good people who are there for the right reasons, even if we disagree. Uh, it's not true for everybody, of course, but for the most part, you're surrounded by lots of really well-meaning people. Um, but the actual day-to-day -day work environment is a lot of incoming information. You've got cable news playing on the TV in front of you. You're constantly scrolling through Twitter to see what your boss or your state or a particular issue, what's happening with that moment to moment. You've got to know what's going on in the news. You have a whole bunch of different events that you're supporting. You know, in my case, as a speechwriter, be preparing talking points or preparing a draft op-ed column or something like that. And so it would change day to day. But the struggle, the perpetual struggle for me was finding the time and headspace to actually write and tune out all of that other distraction because you know, as anybody, as any writer knows, you can't, you, well, some people, I guess, could operate in that environment for, but for me, I needed to tune all that out, turn off the incoming information so I could actually think and create and try to find a sliver of what, you know, Cal Newport calls deep work. And it was actually reading his book about deep work while I was working as a speechwriter that fundamentally changed how I approached that job. And so, you know, one of the takeaways for me of trying to be a speechwriter is seeing writing not as something that I'm just going to check off the to-do list, but actually more of a craft, something that I progress over time and something that I get better at. And once for me, once I flipped from seeing write speech as just something I checked off the list to something that I wanted to get better at and something that I needed to get better at and something that I really had no choice but to get better at because that was the job in the first place. For me, that was a fundamental shift in how I looked at what I was working. And now that I've left that world, I try to think back to those lessons and think about, you know, what else about how I work can I start to see as a craft instead of just as a series of tasks. And for me, it's that type of reframing that really is the foundation for this book. How difficult was it to make that change, considering that probably most people will be doing the, the complete opposite of what you're doing? They'll be tuning in, they'll be, they'll be constantly looking at news and, and updates. How was that making that shift after reading? Was it specifically after reading that deep work book or was there other factors that came into it? I think I'd been moving in that direction before that, just recognizing that I couldn't get done what I needed to get done if I always had information coming at me from six different channels. Um, and I think that feeling that we're all way too familiar with of at the end of the day, you know, you're exhausted, your brain has just stopped functioning, but you don't actually know what you did that day besides push around a lot of emails or respond to a lot of things that people asked of you. And so for me, it was, I was moving away from that, trying to get away from that feeling. And, you know, I recognized that after a day where I'd spent a solid two or three hours working on a speech for the Senator who I was writing for, then I felt a lot better at the end of that than I did just sending emails all day. So it was deep work that really made that concrete for me that brought it from something I was thinking about and realizing and trying to figure out. Um, it brought it into my consciousness in a way that I think a lot of good books do, which is, really make solid something that you've been thinking about, you had an idea about, you had an inkling about, but haven't necessarily been able to articulate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think politics is a unique work environment, but it's also very representative of a lot of work environments in different industries and in different sectors, because it is characterized by a very short-term thinking 
you know, it can change overnight because of a scandal or a crisis or a national disaster, or as we all found out, a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's characterized by a lot of uncertainty for that same reason. And it's characterized by constant distractions and constant striving. And the striving being on an individual level, you want to progress your career, you want to work for, you know, the next member who's perhaps a little bit more senior in the leadership, or you want to work for a different committee that's handling an issue that you're passionate about. You want to get a promotion so you're working on more substantive tasks instead of just responding to letters or processing the mail that comes in. So there's all these different levels that as an individual you're striving for. And then of course there's the more commonly thought of political striving for the next office, the next leadership post, the way to get a little bit closer to power. So there's all these different tensions and uh, incentives to keep striving, keep working, keep thinking about the next thing, which makes it very difficult to focus and try to find some joy and fulfillment in what you're actually doing at any given moment. And so for all of these reasons, it was tough to try to tune all of that out for the couple hours that I needed to actually spend working on a speech or a series of talking points or a draft article. And I think, you know, every, every office, every work environment, every team is a little bit different. But one of the things that made my work writing for Senator Chris Coons of Delaware, who is my last boss in the Senate, who I wrote for, one of the things that made that job so fulfilling for me is having a team who understood that Adam's not going to be checking email for the next couple of hours. And we know we need to accommodate that because he can't really do his job otherwise. And I don't know if that's true for every team, every office, you know, every Senate speech writing team. It's, it's, for me, I was very lucky to find people who appreciated that because like you said, that's not a normal way of working today, whether in politics or any other industry, we are expected to always be online. That little green light next to your name on Skype or whatever needs to always be on. And in a lot of ways, being busy and being present, not in the sense of actually engaging with human beings in front of you, but always being available for whatever somebody needs from you, that is seen as being successful at your job. And I think we've really lost the plot when it comes to that. And I was lucky to, to be in an office where that wasn't the case. Yeah, that's really great that they're actually accommodating to that because like the thing that I've found in, in, in particular is this open work environment. So I've worked in, in places where you'd have... Yeah, I've had a job when I worked for the civil service in the UK. So I worked in finance and you'd have these open plan offices where you'd have upwards of 70 to 80 people in sort of like a, an open work environment. And that is the most counterintuitive thing for deep work, because not only are you having the, the background noise of, of, you know, people on phone calls, but then you have people walking in and out. And that really does affect your ability to yeah. get down and do effective, meaningful work because someone could say something and it's very easy just to say, oh no, you can just put on headphones, which they used to say to us. But it's like, it's not that easy to just put on your headphones and zone out because people will come and tap on your shoulder. People, you know, come and speak to the person in front of you or they'll have a joke and start laughing. And all these things affect your ability to concentrate, which is, right. is obviously related to your ability to do, you know, constructive work. Is part of you missing being in in that environment at the moment, given what's happening, not only with, you know, the presidential campaigns, but also with the pandemic as part of you thinking, you know, what it'd be like to be there right now and, and be part of it. Yeah. It's something that I've been thinking a lot about. And to your previous point, I completely agree. And I think a lot of the challenges with deep work are around it. You know, it's not just having a physical isolation from other people to be able to work, but it's, even if you do that, you've still got all of the stimuli coming at you on the screen. So it's a many layer challenge. Um, and I think, you know, to your question, absolutely. And it's weird. And I write about this a little bit toward the end of the book. I miss it on a few different levels. And one level is something that I've tried to just build awareness of, which is that I feel a sense of FOMO, a fear of missing out by not being on Capitol Hill right now. And the way I describe it in the book, I, the example I use is the State of the Union, you know, the president's speech to Congress and every year in January. And every time that comes around, even in the few years since I've left politics, I have felt a sense of FOMO, like I should be in the Capitol listening to the speech, which I don't ever think that I did because it's hard to get tickets to go in, you know, every year, but mm. it's physically wanting to be close to it, even though I know I'm happier not working in politics right now. I'm more fulfilled because I have time to write and do things like have these conversations and be with my partner in the UK where we are living in 
a city that, you know, we've been here for about two and a half, three years, but it's a different experience for us than being in Washington, D.C. I was burned out in politics and I recognize that. And I think I would have left regardless of how the 2016 election had played out. So even on all these levels, I recognize that there's nothing about being physically in the U.S. Capitol for the President's State of the Union address that I actually want to be there for. But I still feel this sense of FOMO of, you know, this fear of missing out for whatever reason. And I know how irrational that is in the way that FOMO often is for a lot of us, but I still feel it anyways. And so on that level, it's something that I'm constantly wrestling with, which is, you know, I would not be happier if I were back there right now. I would not be more fulfilled. I'm very content where I am, but we still feel it anyways. Mm -hmm. So that's one level. And then the other level I think is something that is a little bit deeper and something that I've been wrestling with and some things that I've written. I wrote a new forward to a company publication of the book back in April. And in that I wrestled out loud because writing is how I think, you know, I think I figure out what I think and I process the world. And I wrestled out loud with this sense of self, um, you know, writing can feel very self-indulgent because it's a solitary activity. And even though I'd be exhausted after a day of writing speeches in the Senate, um, I felt like just being there, playing my little part in a cause that I believed in, that gave me a sense of purpose day to day. And where I am now, I'm writing and finding meaning and fulfillment in that, but I don't feel necessarily that I'm part of this larger cause or commitment. And I think there is a sense and a pull that I feel to get back into the fight, into a struggle somehow and use the fortune and the privilege that I have in my life to try to do some good and to try to serve my community to serve people around me in some capacity. And what I'm trying to figure out is if I tell myself that I'm doing that through writing, am I just telling myself what I want to hear? Or am I actually giving myself genuine reassurance that the writing that I have adds value to the world? And so I think it's a tension that a lot of writers feel. I think it's probably a tension that a lot of creators feel in any capacity, in any medium. And that is something that I don't know what the outcome will be, but I, the more that I can bring it into my awareness and recognize that that tension is going to sit in my mind and then I can try to get some space from it and make a little bit of sense of it, that puts me in a much better place than if I'm just following my impulses or following FOMO back and forth across the Atlantic all the time. I think I'm in a better place now to figure out what I want to do and where I want to be. It doesn't answer the question, but I think I'm better placed to process it now than I was a few years ago. Yeah. That awareness is very important, I think. I think that's probably the most important thing. And I know you talk about in the book because you made the switch, didn't you? When you were in um, the Capitol and you, was, you wanted to go back to be uh, running as, a, was it a congressman for in, in for Colorado? For a state house seat. Yeah, so just one level down. But yeah, for a state house representative seat in my home state of Colorado. Yeah, and and you were, you explained in the book how, you know, you were umming and ahhing and, and making that decision then ultimately you you actually made the move going back to the capital and that's probably what you're probably kind of working out in your mind as well now is like you have that FOMO but you probably realized from that first time the feelings and the feelings always going to be there I think you're right to suggest that that feeling is always going to be there but it's knowing that it's knowing that it's just knowing that the feeling is always going right. to be there and, and and how you're going to deal with that and I think I think that's really important to understand and, and you're making a making a valid point when it comes to as a, I mean, I think you're doing a, a great, and I think it's important for the listeners to know that you're donating the profits for this book to charity. Is that correct? Yes. And that's actually one of the ways when I've tried to reconcile these two uh, impulses towards trying to do some sort of public service while also following the craft and practicing the craft that I love of writing, which is that, um, every, all of the author profits from sales of Reframe the Day go to the coronavirus response efforts of the global organization, Direct Relief. And my hope there, besides trying to do some good on my own with the sales of this book, is that at a time when we're all trying to figure out ways to contribute and do a little bit of good and try to make sense of the world, um, in, in addition to just staying home and physically distancing and wearing a mask and that kind of thing, mm. we're looking for ways to contribute. And my hope is that people can buy this book and find some value in it for themselves, but also know that a little bit of their money is not going to me, but it's going to direct relief, which is doing amazing work with COVID-19 response around the world. Uh, so that is, I'm glad you teed that up because that's one of those places of where I've tried to find little ways to reconcile mm. these competing things that I want to be doing and want to be focusing on while recognizing that 
it's impossible for any one of us to do it all. And so we have to make choices. We have to accept these trade-offs. Yeah, and you're right. It is a trade-off. It's the trade-off of not only the time that you're going to dedicate to certain things, but also the the avenues in which you can go down. So at, at the same time that you you feel like you want to do everything, uh, you just have to be considerate of the time in which it takes to do the things that you want to do. And, and you make that very aware in the book. It's what do you want to focus your time on? What is the meaningful things that you need to get done? One of the things that stood yeah. out to me in the book was that relationship between busyness and productivity. Now, I'm sure you saw it and you probably were like this before deep work, um, reading that book. And I know I was, especially when I started going into my first job and something I really detest even to this day is this, I'm really busy. Um, and I see it all the time, you know, people running around, you know, laptop in hand, you know, coffee in another hand saying, you know, I can't reply to this email. I can't do that. Cause I'm going from meeting to meeting to meeting. And then I kind of look at that and I'm like, well, you're not actually doing any work. And I never understood it when I was working. Right. And I was like, you're not doing any productive work. You're just bouncing from meeting to meeting to meeting. But they, it's almost like a life lie. Like I know Alfred Adler talks about in his psychology um, that we all have life lies that we convince ourselves. And I think busyness as productivity has to be the biggest life lie when it comes to the working world, because I don't know how many percent of people, but so many people use that as an excuse for productivity. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I want to, for you to explain that in a bit more depth, the relationship between what people perceive to be busyness and what, perceive, what people perceive to be productivity. Yeah, that's a great point. And I love that concept of life lies. And I think one of the things that makes life lies and these types of things so insidious is that we don't even realize that we're doing them. We might catch glimpses of awareness here and there. And I think those of us who recognize the insanity of it, and I'll explain what that insanity is in a second, I've, you know, we're very fortunate to be able to separate ourselves from it to some extent and recognize that our own self-worth doesn't depend on how many emails we send or how full our calendar is of meetings on any given day. But even though we're lucky enough to recognize that to some extent, we still get still A, we operate in a world that does not necessarily recognize that. And B, this stuff is so powerful that it, it can suck you in and even if objectively, it's like I was saying about FOMO, even if you objectively, intellectually recognize that busyness does not define your value as an employee, as an individual, as a person, we can still feel very insecure about that. And it still channels, you know, and hooks on to some of, some of our deepest insecurities about proving our value to the world. So to take a step back, I think um, the chapter where I talk about this, I, I title Resist the Productivity Obsession because I think at the root of this is this obsession with being productive all the time. And by productivity there, I don't mean doing things necessarily that we love doing or things that we genuinely need to do. I'm not saying that we should all stop doing anything at all because productivity is a scam. What I mean by productivity in this sense is the idea that we judge the value of who we are as individuals, as employees, as human beings, as spouses, as members of a team, leaders of a team. We judge all of that by how much we think we produce. And I think the roots of this productivity obsession are deep and they're societal and cultural and probably more than we have time for on this one podcast. And it goes certainly in the US and a lot of Western cultures, it goes deep into this obsession with the individual and the individual striving and proving one's own worth. You know, it has its roots in the way that capitalism works and the way that capitalism, when it gets a little bit out of control, um, can really equate an individual's value that they add to the world with how much they produce on a balance sheet. So there's lots of different places that it comes from, but at the end of the day, especially folks who are working in some sort of knowledge capacity where they're not producing widgets, they're not on an assembly line, they're not in some sort of retail or service. You can't measure what a lot of people do when they work from nine to five or nine to nine every single day, because you could measure emails, you could measure LinkedIn connections. Um, but beyond that, we have a really hard time measuring what we mean by productivity, yet we're obsessed with being productive all the time. So instead of using productivity, because we don't have a, you know, a good way to measure it, we end up using busyness instead. Busyness is the proxy 
for productivity. So we assume we've been productive if we look at our calendar at the end of the day and we say, oh, I was in 17 different meetings and Zoom calls today. I must have been productive because I'm exhausted because I never had time to think or eat or have a snack or go to the bathroom. So I must have been busy. And then, like you said, the folks who are running around, you know, back when people could go outside and run around with their laptops and, you know, on the tube working with the Bluetooth earpiece in, you know, maybe a podcast in the other ear because I want to catch up on podcasts. It's, it's just this deeply ingrained idea that the way you, that you add value to the world is being productive. And the way you show that you're productive is by being busy all the time. Mm. And there are a lot of writers, some of whom I quote in the book, who have talked about this, the idea that, you know, busyness comes from a whole lot of different places. It might be an inability or an unwillingness to say no to things that people ask of us. It might come from at a deeper level, recognizing that the work we're doing day in and day out doesn't really matter. And we know that, but that's a really uncomfortable thing to accept. And it's far easier to bury that feeling under a packed calendar or an, you know, a never ending to-do list. So it comes from a lot of different places, but I think for me, the root of it all is this idea that our value is equal to our productivity. And because we don't know how to measure productivity, we use a proxy measure of busyness. And then before you know it, you have a culture in which being busy is a sign of your value to your employer or yourself. And we get so caught up in it that we don't even realize it. And we look back at the end of the day, at the end of a tenure and a job, you know, at the end of a lifetime, and we say, what did we actually do? And was it send emails? Was it send calendar invites? Was it set up Zoom calls? And I think a lot of us wrestle with this, and I'm certainly still wrestling with it, even as I wrote a chapter about productivity and busyness, and I've been talking about it in conversation since I published the book, I still find myself struggling at the end of the day to just stop moving, stop working, and just read a book that I'm interested in. Mm. And for all of these reasons, you know, it just reflects how deeply this stuff is entrenched in the way so many of us live and work. Breathe, Adam. I think my camera's just uh, stopped working, but... Um... Yeah, I totally agree. I think for me, when the when that relationship happens, I think it's it's important to understand what you can and can't do to change the existing structure of the organization that you're in. I think some people feel like they have to conform to the idea of how people are working in the environment. <laughs> the thing for me is, I remember going to meetings and you sit there and they spend half the meeting chatting about what they had for lunch how their family is. And I'm like, I remember reading an article and I cannot remember who it was by, but it was saying like all half an hour meetings should be eight minute meetings. And you should just go in, mm -hmm. discuss the topic and go. Like if you make it seven or eight meet minutes, like majority of meetings can be had in that space of time. And I thought that was a, a really important way to, to change the way in which we see time. Cause I think the way in which we mm -hmm. see time is like, you've got eight hours or eight and a half hours in the day if you're working your standard nine to five and that is a long time to work like i think who where was it in the in a book that i read recently where it said that in only in the uk that there's out there working for an average of only three hours a day or two and a half hours a day it wasn't yeah, yeah it's it's something it's something strange like that and most of the time they're just like making cups of tea or just chatting about their life in general and i think when you have <laughs> right. awareness of that I think it's, I think it's really important to understand that. And I think that awareness, like you address in the book, and I think this is why the book is so great because it, it gives awareness to individuals that you, you, you would be doing this. And, and I know I've been doing this, but I felt like I was doing it because I felt like I had to, because that's right. why I felt like the system around me was pertaining to me acting in that way. It wasn't like I, I wasn't, as if I came in there thinking this way, it was the system itself was yes. enabling me to act in that way. And I think once you break away from that and you read books like Deep Work and you read books like from Stephen Pressfield, I know you talk about Stephen Pressfield in the mm -hmm. book as well. I think that's really important. And it's, it's great that you were highlighting this. In your newsletter that you sent yesterday, you talk a lot about, you, well, you talked about reassigning the idea of deep work because it's something that I, it's funny the I, I read the newsletter and i was like it's very interesting because i'm doing the same thing so i am and currently rereading deep work by cal newport because i felt like i was getting into a, a rut of doing 
as a creator and someone who puts content out and people who has a, as someone who has a community, you always feel like you have to be online or answering comments or whatever it is. And I felt like I was constantly having the itch of going to my phone and mm -hmm. I was thinking to myself, okay, I need to sort of reset and, and go into that book. When you've revisited the book again and revisiting the idea, what is the things that have come to mind again? Or what are the, what are the things that are, you are highlighting and want to do on a day-to-day -day level to improve uh, that level of deep work that you want to get out? Yeah, I love that question because it reflects just how insidious these distraction devices that we all carry around with us are. And to your earlier point about feeling like sometimes you're the only one in a team or an organization who thinks, what are we actually doing here? Why are we having so many calls and meetings just to plan for our next call and meeting? Or like you said, why are we spending the first 20 minutes of the call just catching up? And there's value in that catching up. I think we probably need to schedule more of that and less of pretending that we're actually working on something. Yeah. Um, so we're actually focused on engaging with the human beings in front of us or virtually in front of us during those times and then actually working for those eight minutes in an intentional way when we want to sit down and actually do some work. So yeah. the idea that it is systemic and that it's not just one workplace, it's not just one individual, I think is really important. And it's something that I've been thinking a lot about since I wrote this book, which is very much focused on what can you as an individual do to take back a little bit of control over how you see the world and how you spend your time. Mm. Um, but there, at the end of the day, the solutions for these problems are societal, they're systemic and they're structural. And I think we all have the power to build more fulfilling days and over time build a more fulfilling life, but that doesn't, that shouldn't take away from attacking and taking on some of the deeper challenges that, you know, we've seen reflected societally over the last few months, um, but really show up in a lot of different ways and including in these day-to-day -day mundane workplace things. Mm. So on this question of going back to deep work and thinking about this concept again and um, trying to refresh my thinking around these ideas since it's, you know, I wrote about them a lot over the last couple of years, but it's been a while since I actually took a step back and revisited what Newport talks about in deep work and some of his other work and his more, his later book, Digital Minimalism. One of the first things I did when I finished this book was read Digital Minimalism, which is a book that I had pre-ordered and very excited for, but knew that if I read it while I was working on my own book, I would just want to cite half of the things that he talked about in digital minimalism and the, you know, eventually I would never publish my own book. So I put that to the side. And so one of the first things I did was read that book, which was very clarifying for me in the way that Newport talks about not just doing a digital detox. And I think he distinguishes, and I forget exactly what he calls it, but it's not, you know, the way he talks about breaking our addiction to our devices and our compulsion to be distracted all the time. And the fact that we've trained ourselves away from being able to focus on a single task in front of us for, you know, more than a few minutes. He doesn't suggest, you know, one by one filtering out the things that aren't working for you because you'll inevitably come back to it. And what he says is, you know, take 30 days and actually do a bit of a reset and try to break the compulsion that we have, you know, the, the pull of whenever we feel boredom to pull out our phone and open up Twitter and to just relieve us from even being able to be bored. So digital minimalism combined with listening some of the episodes of his new podcast, Deep Questions has been for me, it's kind of like a daily meditation on or weekly meditation on some of the issues that he talks about. And the thing I've been really trying to, to dive into recently, which I wrote about in this newsletter yesterday, which folks can check out on my website, adamel.blog, the, the, the thing that I'm trying to figure out is this concept of time blocking, which he writes about in deep work and which I had never really focused on, but it's basically, you know, people should check out his work if they want to get really into it. But it's basically, as you know, assigning every minute of your working day. So in my case, I try to make that, you know, nine to five, nine to six, try to have some sort of work-life balance um, to that previous conversation we had about productivity and busyness and trying to turn off the compulsion to work all the time. So say I have, nine to six, I've got my day job, I've got certain calls and commitments throughout that time. I've got promoting this book and talking about this book that I want to be doing. I've got some other new writing that I want to be working on. And then there's other things for me. It's, you know, meditation, going for a walk, working out, talking to my family, priorities that I want to make sure I fit in as well. And I want to make sure that these things get the time they deserve. 
So it's going through that nine to six calendar at the start of the day or the end of the previous day and saying, for these 90 minutes at the start of the day, I'm going to work on this new article. Then I'm going to take 30 minutes and do, you know, catch up on emails. And then actually at that, you know, after those first two hours, when that 30 minute block ends, then I'm going to work on X project or Y project for my day job. And the way that he describes time blocking is it's, it sounds like you're trying to micromanage and over prescribe your days, but all it really does, because there's plenty of flexibility built in there is it forces you to account for the fact that none of us have enough time in the day to do everything that we want to do. We are going to have to make these trade-offs and how we spend our time. And by seeing the whole day, instead of starting with a to-do list with 25 things and thinking today's the day, it's never happened before, but today is different. Today's the day I'll get it all done. It forces us to reckon with the fact that that's never going to be true. So if you want to get something done, you need to prioritize it and make sure you carve out that time for it. And the thing that I'm really struggling with, which I wrote about in this newsletter a little bit, is holding myself accountable for my own time. And if I say I'm going to work on an article from 9 to 10, and then from 10 to noon, I need to work on this work project or something, then I need to no one's going to be tracking my minutes except for me. It's not like a meeting where it's going to start right after that, you know, at 10 o'clock or something. So I need to be accountable to myself just as I would be for a meeting invitation or a call invitation that somebody else sent me and actually start and end when I say I will. And over time, my hope is that I'll be able to train myself to treat my own set time boundaries with the same respect that I would in the, you know, a meeting invitation or, you know, the time that we started this podcast, I'm not going to show up a half hour late and say, all right, let's get to it. Yeah. It, you know, that just doesn't work like that, but we do that with our own time. And the way I, one of the potential value points I see in time blocking is trying to self arrest that tendency and actually take back a little bit of control over how we spend our time. And that's my hope, at least I to be determined if it, if it actually works well, out that way. Even if it doesn't work out to the way that you want it to, even that self-awareness will improve your ability to conduct your time in a better way. So I hope that's even, right. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you, you know, if you're not doing it to, let's say the absolute minute or second, even that awareness will allow you the ability to say, okay, even if it's been five minutes here or there, okay, now I'm going to get back to doing this thing. Or if you get distracted for whatever reason, I think the awareness yeah. bit is the, is the start of it. And I think this is why, for instance, I would actually like to ask you a question. Do you have a set morning routine? Because my, my thing of it is I see a lot of people online talking about, you know, they get up at five o'clock and then at five ten they meditate and at five twenty they journal and then at five thirty they exercise. And I'm like, that just doesn't work in practice. Like no one does that. You have to be a robot. Like no one does that. Most right. people snooze, uh, put the snooze on their alarm for 10, 15 minutes and then kind of like struggle up from bed and kind of like half awake and stumble into like the bathroom and do your thing. And then you might start your day do you have a set routine or do you do it by, I know in the book you talk a lot about mindfulness and meditation and and how you've grown Mm -hmm. that practice and you talk about it extensively in the book. Do you have a set routine in which you fit that in or do you sort of do it throughout the day? How do you structure that? Yeah. So that's, it actually ties really nicely into this concept of time blocking because one of the things that I'm hoping that time blocking can help me do Mm. is use that sense of awareness that you mentioned, which I think is right on. And for me, I struggle so much with setting unrealistic expectations for how much I can achieve in a given amount of time. I'm awful at predicting how long it takes me to do anything, whether it's, it's why I'm perpetually late. It's why I've had be on time as a new year's resolution for like my entire adult life, because I have such a bad sense of how long it takes me to do anything. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that time blocking forces you to do is if you set this, uh, calendar for the day this is how i'm going to spend my time then at the end of the day you look at how you actually spent your time having to reconcile those two for me at least it forces me to say oh that thing i thought would take me an hour actually took me two and a half hours and so now next time i'm thinking about a project like that i need to think of that in the more of a two and a half hour range instead of thinking it's going to take an hour and the way this ties into morning routines for me is this idea of expectation setting so there are absolutely things that if I manage to do them every morning, I feel really good for the rest of the day for the most part. And the way I talk about this in the book is, you know, by knowing the activities and the people who you spend time with and the type of work you like to do, the things that 
bring you fulfillment by prioritizing those and trying to do those in the morning and generating some sort of fulfillment activity early in the day, no matter what happens in the rest of the day. And for most of us, most days get away from us by the end of the day. Um, by doing that in the morning, you've made sure to prioritize that and it really sets the tone for the rest of the day. So yes, there are some things I like to do every morning. You know, if I can set aside time to meditate, uh, read a little bit and write down my thoughts or work on an article, those for me, those are the three things that if I can do those before, you know, eight or nine in the morning, I don't have a set time for it. I've tried that in the past and, you know, it's just not realistic, like you said. And the thing about having a set time or trying to do 27 things before you actually start your day at 9 a.m. or something or before your day job starts at that time or before you have to commute, again, back when that was a thing, all that does is set these wildly unrealistic expectations and that just sets you up for disappointment and frustration. And I used to think like being ambitious about how much I could get done and trying to do more stuff in less time, that was the recipe towards contentment and fulfillment. And this book in a lot of ways is me trying to step back from that mentality and recognizing that, you know, one, it is not defeat to say it is impossible for me to do an interview for the book, write a new article, meditate, read, do some journaling, work out, shower all before nine o'clock every single morning. That's humanly impossible, hmm. you know, for most people, certainly for me. And by yeah, having those insane in morning. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Which is sustainable one day. Yeah, exactly. And like, and I, I think actually this idea of sleep, because, you know, if you were getting up at three in the morning, you can't go to bed at the same time that you were going to bed before, you know, if a very lucky few of us can exist on four or five hours of sleep a night, but it's not realistic for most of us. And it does not allow us to perform at our mm -hmm. best day in and day out. It does not allow us to show up for the people who we care about in a human meaningful way because we are not at our best when we sleep, you know, three or four hours a night for most of us. And I think this, you know, trying to hack sleep falls into this same broader category of trying to be more productive, trying to fit more things in and setting these crazy expectations for what we can accomplish. And for me, it's this, all of this is a practice and it's for, this practice for me is about trying to lower my expectations, trying to be more realistic about what I can do. Uh, because not only do I not set myself up for inevitable frustration when I come up short and then I'm down on myself and I'm, you know, the motivation is sapped and I've lost my inspiration for the day and I'm feeling sorry for myself by setting lower expectations. I then meet or exceed those. I'm actually enjoying what I'm doing. I'm a lot more present in the moment instead of just counting down till the next thing that I have to do. And kind of ironically, then you're actually going to be a lot more productive. Then you're going to produce better work then you're going to actually show up for the people who you care about. You're going to be able to have a conversation with a spouse or a friend or a family member who needs you to be there without being on your phone or worried about needing to get to the next meeting or the next thing that you have to do. So it's a very long way of saying that I try to do these things every morning and then I practice when I come up short, which happens all the time. I, I try to use that as an opportunity to practice a little bit of forgiveness for myself, forgiveness of the circumstances, and then mm. try to get back after it the next day. And then, more broadly, trying to make my expectations for what I can achieve more realistic on a day-to-day -day time frame because in, in expectations are something with, that I'm wrestling with a lot right now and I don't talk about in the book, at least not explicitly, but I think it underlies a lot of the exhaustion that so many of us feel with our work, our work lives right now. I think that's Clyde. I know you don't reference it specifically, but I think that's tied into FOMO because I think what a lot of people yes. do is they over schedule their diary or they overestimate i mean I'm, i remember reading this book i recently read this book called range by david epstein yes and an excellent book, book yeah and in that book he talks about the idea of how as humans we're terrible at estimating we're terrible at estimating how long things will take and mm -hmm. our ability to judge um, what's going to happen in the future and i think that's really linked to the idea of how we schedule our own time and i think people are scared to say I just can't do that in that period of time, or that seems mm -hmm. too much to do that. There's they're more like on the overly optimistic side of saying, yes, I can do all of this because it gives them that feeling that they're not missing out or they're actually more productive than they, than they, um, than they say they are because it gives them the feeling that they're actually busy rather than productive. And it's actually being honest with yeah. yourself and saying, 
okay, I can't actually do this. And this is, I feel like what a lot of people struggle with when working is they don't want to let not only their boss down or they don't want to, they don't want to put themselves in a position where they seem like they can't do the work in the time frame that they're needed. And they don't push back and say, that is an unrealistic time frame. And I've had that right. at work where people have been asked me to do something in like two hours for a report. And I'm like, that's just unrealistic expectation. But they're just like, do your best. And then you send it and they're like, well, that's not what we were looking for. And I'm like, <laughs> well, it's an unrealistic expectation. You know? Right. And but pe people feel like they can't say anything or do anything because of that pushback. So I think that's really important to be honest with yourself and say, with your own work or, or whether it's at work and just say, what can I achieve in this time frame, and what can't I achieve? And I think it goes back to the self-awareness part because you will fail and you will have times where you don't match your expectations, but then it's saying, okay, how can I change my schedule or how can I fit in pieces of work, whether it's putting more task onerous things at the beginning of the day or then mm -hmm. leaving emails for the end of the day. That's something that I'm actually doing at the moment. So I'm yeah. basically blocking out the morning or pretty much before 10 o'clock in the morning and saying no meetings, no, you know, phone calls before 10 o'clock. And then I have like a good four hours or so three or four hours where I can just get what I need to get done. Right. You know, whether it's actually, as a good point, do you schedule time? And I know you talk about in the book about the, 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 the benefits of not say boredom, but time in which just to think, do you schedule time in just for like, writing uh, your own thoughts or just to think and let your thoughts become manifest itself because i know you said you use yeah. writing as a way of thinking yeah so it's something that i'm working on and one of the things i talk about in the book i use the example of the former u.s secretary of state george schultz who mm -hmm. scheduled an hour every week where the only people who were allowed to interrupt that hour were his boss who was the president or his wife and for that hour, he would just, I think, have a notepad in front of him and he would just think long term. He would think about the bigger issues that his day to day existence as the Secretary of State, the most senior diplomat for the United States, that job did not allow him that time except for that one hour of week. And the column where he talks about this, um, he calls it a Schultz hour, which, you know, we can, most of us can probably find more than an hour. What I try to do every day is, I actually have on my to-do list um, a task, a recurring task every day for think, a recurring task for walk, a recurring task for write. And those, I don't do those things every single day, but having them on the to-do list reminds me to prioritize them as much as I have like pay bills or grocery shop or something mm -hmm. like that. Some mundane thing that is going to end up on the to-do list so I don't forget in the same way, I need to put the things that I care the most about that I want to make sure I carve out time for on that list as well. And one thing that as I'm going through time blocking and trying to make it part of, you know, make it more of a habit and trying to bring my expectations more into line with reality in terms of how much I can do and how long it takes me to do certain things through time blocking, I'm hoping that I can start to schedule that time, like you said, like schedule 60 minutes in the morning for just journaling. And then I might not end up using that time. I might just spend 30 minutes of that time writing down a grocery list, or I might just keep working on a column that I have, um, you know, percolating in the back of my mind that I've wanted to put to paper for a while. Mm -hmm. But my hope is that I can go from the to-do list and use time blocking to actually put it onto my calendar because, you know, there's somebody who I quote in the book who says basically like, if you don't schedule it, it doesn't get done. These things are all priorities for us as individuals, but so much of our time we allow to be dictated by people other than us and sometimes that's inevitable like we have bosses we have teammates we have family members and friends like people depend on us and we should show up for them and this doesn't mean we should just start declining every calendar invitation we get and start you know living an isolated life and just doing everything we want i think that would be the wrong takeaway from this but it is trying to be proactive about reclaiming some of your time as best you can. And, you know, whether it's a Schultz hour that you have one, you know, every Friday afternoon or five minutes at the start or end of every day, just with an iPhone note or, you know, a smartphone note in front of you, there are lots of different ways to make a routine or make a habit out of downloading what's going on in your brain. And for me, you know, that's where Reframe the Day came from was just an iPhone note where I started thinking about what have I learned, you know, in the first six months since I moved to the UK and left the world of politics? 
why do I feel so content here? You know, what are the things that are causing that? If I hadn't given myself time, I think while I was on a train somewhere to actually download those little things floating in and out of my subconscious, like that was the root of reframe the day. And it took a whole lot of hours and a whole lot more than that one iPhone note, but that was the start of it. And so I know intellectually the value of baking that time every day. But of course, just because we know something is good for us doesn't mean we actually do it. And so that's, that's where the practice comes in for me is Mm -hmm. trying to figure out how I can prioritize this time, whether it's through a to-do list or a calendar or just making it a habit. And, you know, that's, that's always a struggle. Mm. Do you use batching? So do you, do you batch tasks? Yeah. And I'm trying to be better about that. And that's another thing that I'm, I think, um, you know, having unrealistic expectations for what you can accomplish. I think for me, has been an excuse not to batch more aggressively because I let, uh, you know, I look at the to-do list and it's not in any particular order. So it says like laundry, write article, empty inbox. Like these three things are of not of equal significance and they are not of equal intensity and they are not of equal time required, but they're just sitting right there, one, two, and three. And so I think the more that I can start batching, the better I am going to be about using the other time for mm-hmm. doing the more meaningful stuff. But is that something that you've, that you do that you've made a habit of? I think as a, as a person who creates content and wants to keep consistency, what I found was when I didn't batch, so I watched a, I watched a YouTube video with Tim Ferriss and he talks about batching and I was aware of it, mm-hmm. but I, he kind of just explained it in a very, very, in a way that kind of resonated with me. Uh, in that, as as someone who creates content and and makes videos, I think there's a lot that goes behind not only the recording, but then you know the kind of semi script to what you're going to say, to then the editing, to then the posting. What I was finding was is when I was doing it singularly, it was taking up way too much time. And then I was looking at my workflow, mm-hmm. and I was like, how can I how can I batch these tasks together? So how can I record a video? Can I spend you know an afternoon just recording all the videos and then can I spend two hours here doing all the editing and then can I spend half an hour to then upload them and then schedule the posts and then you know and it's thinking about ways in which I can batch these tasks together every single week at the same time to then Mm -hmm. improve my workflow so then I can spend more time doing the things that I actually want to do you know obviously I want to do these things they're important things for, for what I'm doing but it's they're necessary things that don't put me they're not the things that i feel like give me the most value like for me i value time just to think like i want to put as much time in my calendar as i can where i'm just sitting there and thinking to myself okay this is what i'm doing this is where i am reflect on my readings and then i'm very similar to you so i think by writing whether it's on my laptop i prefer to do it you know longhand with a with a fountain pen because i feel like that was just a bit more raw and and i feel like mm-hmm. when you type you can really type on you can honestly sometimes type too quickly for the way you're thinking but it, you can't write quicker than you can think if that makes sense so i, I yes let's come back to that because i have a question for you about that yeah and so for me it's that idea of how can you how can i find time or maximize my time to think and then back chain came in so mm-hmm something that I use. Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. And it's something that I I think I need to get better at. And I've been amazed by, I think similarly, I'm definitely not on as many different platforms actively as I know that you are, but even just trying to promote this book and even having cut out social media for the most part from how I spend my time right now, because I realized I couldn't, if I wanted to engage as intentionally on the writing and some of the other aspects of the work that I want to be doing, talking about this book, publishing new articles, things like that. I could not have social media in my life really in any meaningful way, but even putting that aside, updating the website, Mm -hmm. catching up on emails, sending out, you know, pitches, things like that. All of that stuff takes a lot of that, that kind of day-to-day time. And like you said, you, you know, you value what that work does, but it's not the writing. It's not the reading. It's not the actual content generation that, are the reason that you got into this game mm. in the first place. Definitely. Definitely. So that that question or that thing you mentioned about why you write longhand instead of type mm. is something that I've been thinking about a lot recently. And I've started writing articles just over the last few months, article drafts, 
not the, you know, the finished draft, but the first draft Mm -hmm. by hand as kind of an experiment to see, does this change how I think, does this change how, does it help me avoid that overwhelming feeling of like a bunch of half sentences that I started typing. And then I thought of another sentence while I was writing that. So I stopped, forgot what I was writing about and then started another one here. And then you look back at it and you've written 2000 words and none of them are finished sentences. And so I'm wondering if, you know, writing by hand is going to help me with that. And so has that been your experience? That's been my experience, especially when I, I've only used it. So I have some uh, some ideas I'm working for towards a book, but they can't haven't formulated in my mind yet. But yeah. I use it for my own sort of thoughts and and my own sort of journaling. I call it journaling, but it's mostly just like thinking, thinking on a on, yeah. thinking on a page, thinking out loud, thinking out loud exactly. So I listen. I, I read an article by Neil Gaiman, the the writer. I don't know if you've mm-hmm. heard about it. He, he's and yes. what he does is he writes his he writes his drafts for full books by hand and he says that the structure of the book and the idea of the characters and the way in which he presents his stories are a lot more detailed because he's able to do it longhand and his ability to think and formulate strength sentence structures is a lot more strong when he's doing it by hand rather than mm-hmm. if he's doing it because when you type you can also you can almost i'm sure you get this as well you can almost type mindlessly without actually yes. thinking about what you're saying and i think you made a great point about half sentences because that sometimes happens like when i'm writing an article or i'm writing something on medium and i'm typing i'm like and i read back and i see what i've written i'm like that's that's just rubbish. It's just, it's just rubbish. And it's, I think what happens is, is you confuse email writing with writing, writing. Like there's a big difference right. between the way in which you formulate an email, which is more conversational within the ability to write something that is expressing a point or an argument or story. And I think that for me has been, I read the, the book, the science of storytelling by Will Storr. Mm-hmm. And that was a that was a great book. I, I recommend it if you haven't read it. But in that, he talks about the idea of storytelling. And I think for me as an individual, I think everyone needs to become better at telling stories, whether it's your story or whether it's other people's stories. And the commonality that I'm seeing for people that are actually writing down ideas, you know, taking a step back and going offline to do this is really is something that I'm I'm really exploring and something that I've found very effective not only for my own thought process but it's something that i'd actually want to translate into into eventually when i definitely start writing a bit more yeah it would be interesting to, you know if, if you did explore that to see what changes that would make yeah and i think it's something i'm going to try writing about in a few weeks and so we'll definitely stay in touch about this but this is one of those moments in the conversation you know where you're thinking about something you're wondering like am i the only person who feels this way like i think the way you said it earlier was you know i I type faster than I can think or something. And that right there, that just crystallized it for me. Like that's why Mm -hmm. writing something by hand can be so satisfying and clarifying in a way that writing on a computer is not. And so this, you know, to be continued here in this particular topic, but Mm -hmm. just on that point about storytelling, you know, I have this great quote from Barack Obama in the book. And I think it's from the memoir of Ben Rhodes, who is his deputy national security advisor. And Mm. this was toward the end of his presidency. And they're in a motorcade and going to a few different places in Vietnam. And they're talking about telling stories. And there's this idea that telling, you know, in this case, the story of America, there's, you know, this notion that telling a story is cheap or it's easy or it's silly or, you know, it's not a mature way to communicate. But what Obama says to Ben Rhodes, and I'm paraphrasing here, is something like, you know, storytelling, that's who we are. You know, that's how we communicate as human beings. And that's, you know, how Yuval Harari talks about this in Sapiens. Like, that's how we have built societies and civilizations is by telling stories and having these collective stories that tie our identities together in a way that's more than just a group of individuals. And so there's so much there in this idea of storytelling. And I think it's probably why, you know, you and I, and so many people find so much value from just writing because it's, you know, writing alone is very clarifying, but then writing and publishing is a way to share what we've learned with other people and to trust that just because I know something doesn't mean that somebody else already knows it or that everybody else already knows it, which I realized, you know, when I was writing this book that I had this instinct that once I learned something, I was the last person to know it and I didn't need to write anything or share anything about it because 
everybody else must already know it too. Cause I know it. Yeah. And, you know, training myself first, having the awareness that I was doing this and then training myself to say, no, maybe there is value in putting myself out there and sharing these other works that I've found valuable. And maybe in a way, what I used to think was maybe egotistical or self-indulgent to be sharing my own thoughts. Maybe the ego was actually in thinking that once I knew something, everybody else knew it. And so there's a lot there and it all ties back to what we were talking about before about the value in writing and publishing. And it's still something that I'm wrestling with. And I think it's very helpful and, you know, always find solidarity and knowing that other people are going through this too, you know, trying to figure out what is the value of all this writing and all the publishing and all the content creating, because as you know, it takes a lot of time and it's exhausting and there's always more that you want to be doing and you can never do everything that you want to. So there are always these trade-offs and there's trade-offs within the work itself. There's trade-offs that you make in life to be able to do the work Mm. and the whole thing can start to feel very exhausting and overwhelming. So there's, there's definitely a lot of solidarity in finding that, you know, A, other people are going through this too. And B, maybe all we need to do is sit down with a physical notepad and a physical pen and just start to make some sense of it. Yeah. I think that's really important. And I think, I think there, there has to be a relationship between your digital self and, you know, the, the way in which you spend your time offline. I think for me, scheduling time online is the best thing that I've ever done. Because I say to myself, okay, I post at this time, I answer comments at this time, and I reply to messages at this time. That's my time I'm going to do it. And it stopped me from basically going, okay, I'm writing something, and it's not going anywhere. And I get that itch that um, Nereal talks about in his book. And then your hand sort of of slowly reaches over to the phone, and you pick it up. And, you know, five minutes later, you're just scrolling through, and you're like, how did this even happen? Like, right. I, I, I don't even recall. There was nothing that I wanted to see that I wasn't checking a notification because I know in the book you talk about reducing your notifications. And that was the singularly, I've done, I've, I did this for years now, but it's singularly the best decision I ever made was to turn off all unnecessary notifications because I found, so I got one of those, um, I got one of those watches. It wasn't an iWatch, but it was like a Garmin and mm-hmm. it was linked to my phone for notifications and it vibrated every time I got a notification. And I was about three days in and I was just like, I, I just got rid of it because like every <laughs> single, every yeah. like two minutes it was beeping. And I, I see people who use them. I'm like, do you not get dis- like, do you not get distracted by this thing on your watch that keeps on beeping or buzzing? Right. And- I'm distracted looking at your watch. Yeah, exactly. Because they keep on looking and and you get distracted by them looking at their watch. And yeah, it's just, it's turning off notifications or being more wary of what you're actually like WhatsApp for me. I have notifications because I want to see if someone sent me a message, if it's urgent, if it's a family member, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But Instagram, why would I put notifications on? Because I get, I get a lot of them. Like I get a lot of messages. I get a lot of like likes and comments or whatever that is. If I had those notifications on, it just, it'd be carnage. It would be carnage on my phone. So right. how have you done that? I know you're spending time offline at the moment. How have you spent, have you, how have you battled that notification, that notification game? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think notifications are a good example of the kind of thing that can make a huge impact in one's day-to-day life because we don't realize just how compulsive we are. And it's not just us because these machines are designed to take our attention. Mm. Like the more attention and data that we can give to whatever sending us a notification, whether it's Twitter, or Instagram, or whatever app you just downloaded, like it's, it's not an accident that we are compelled to check these things all the time. Like it's some of the most, you know, our most vulnerable instincts are being preyed upon by these companies. Um, to boost their share prices and gather data. So, you know, it's not just us. And this is one of those things where turning off notifications can be really, really useful. But at the same time, all of us turning off notifications doesn't address the underlying issue of uh, tech companies, say, that are, you know, taking advantage of our vulnerabilities as human beings and monetizing them, which is a much bigger discussion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having said that, turning off notifications can make a really big difference. And it's one of those things that you think that you need until you turn it off. And then you realize not only did I not need that, but I'm so much more present and content now Mm -hmm. than I was before. And in the book, I 
talk about social media in the sense of you know, like the question we often use to justify staying on social media, you know, like in your case, you know, this is, this is how you share content. This is a business. And I think, but the way, it, you know, we as individuals often use social media just in our personal lives as we say, well, I would miss out on X, Y, or Z if I were not on this service. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I found most useful, because it's true, I'm, you know, I'm not on, I haven't been on Facebook forever. And, you know, I'm off Instagram again, which I wrote this newsletter about a couple of weeks ago. And I rarely engage on some of these other platforms. And I undoubtedly miss out on things by not being on those platforms. So I try not to think about what would I miss out if I didn't have Facebook, if I didn't use notifications, because you do miss out on things. And we're not being realistic if we say that we're not. For me, the question is, are they benefiting me more than they're harming me? Mm -hmm. Are they giving me more than they're taking away? Mm -hmm. Because that acknowledges that there are pros and cons to all of these services and technologies. And for me, it's a more realistic way about looking at it. And then I'm not trying to convince myself that I'm not going to miss out on something because there are friends with babies who I would love to know what's going on in their lives mm -hmm. and, you know, about their new kids and, you know, what their pets are doing and where they are in their careers and all of that stuff. And on balance though, a, I can get that from them in through human to human conversation as human beings have been doing for thousands of years, mm -hmm. but B like, yes, I'm going to miss out on that, but the negatives of these platforms and of these technologies for me dramatically outweigh the positives. And so that, that way for me, having a more realistic sense of the pros and cons, not just saying it's all good or all bad mm -hmm. um, has helped me stick with this a little bit more. And at the same time though, it's still, I've gotten, worse and worse over the past couple of years at responding to text messages, WhatsApp messages, emails from friends and family, the things that are really important to me. And of all the digital, you know, information that comes into my phone, some of the most important things. And I think one of the things that people in my life have learned is that I'm, I'm going to respond, but I'm not necessarily going to respond right away and mm. not going to respond in the way that they might be used to from, other friends or family members. Um, and I hope, I still feel a little bit insecure and anxious about that, but I hope people appreciate that, you know, not responding is not a personal thing, you know, not responding instantaneously. And I think this ties into this broader conversation we've been having about societal expectations for work and busyness and productivity and mm -hmm. being online and available all the time, being, you know, responding instantaneously. And you can do all these things but that means you can't do a lot of other things as well. And for me, the trade-off is like, I want to prioritize being present with my partner. I want to prioritize writing. I want to prioritize meditating and reading. And if I'm going to prioritize those, that means I'm not going to respond to WhatsApp messages maybe until the end of the day, you know, even if somebody sent it to me at 8.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're all constantly navigating these tensions and I'm not going to say that I don't feel it. And I'm not going to say that I don't get distracted all the time. Cause I absolutely do. I do exactly what you were saying about picking up my phone instinctively and opening up Gmail to read some political newsletter before I realize what has even happened and that, Oh yeah, I was actually checking the weather or something yeah. 25 minutes ago and my computer's gone to sleep with the article that I was writing. And so I'm not going to say none of that stuff happens to me, but putting these systems in place and setting expectations for myself and for friends and family about my responsiveness. And, you know, one of the things that Cal Newport talks about is like, as long as you're reliable to the people who need your know, information, response, approval, whatever from you, mm -hmm. they don't need it right away. You know, a client doesn't necessarily need to, you to be online 24 seven and responding right away. They just need to know that you're going to get to them what you said you would get to them at the time you said you would get it to them. And so I'm trying to prioritize reliability over instant responsiveness. And it's a constant work in progress, but I think little things, building systems like turning off notifications, that stuff really helps. And mm -hmm. we don't think it will until we do it. And then there's this moment of clarity when it's like, why didn't I do this six months ago? And then you become an evangelist for it as you and I have been, mm -hmm. and we become those annoying people to our friends who are like, you know, really probably didn't need that Instagram notification, yeah. but people have to go on their own journey. I think. I think, and as well, I think you made an interesting point about getting back to people. And I feel like that has somewhat been my downfall when establishing relationships with people. Cause I've been doing this for years now. Like 
I'm not very good at, and it's a conscious choice. It's not me not being good at it because I've tried it, but the mental impact that it has on me to constantly reply to people on a minute by minute basis is it takes a lot of your effort and time and mm -hmm. mental energy to be constantly checking your phone and replying to people. Yes. And that energy I've found is diminishes your ability to do the things that you actually need to do. And I found this when I was at university, because when you're there, you almost feel like you, you have to be somewhat of a socialite. You have to be constantly finding friends, communicating with people. And I studied political science and it just, it was counterintuitive to my ability to, to read extensively, to write well and write compelling essays and, and in fact, for my dissertation, I think I went on a digital like fast. Like I just didn't look at my phone for like weeks pretty much because, yeah. and what I found in that exercise was actually quite transformative when I look back at it, because I went through periods where I was able to just think and through that thinking, it enabled me for the work to improve tremendously. And after I submitted, I was, I almost had this level of, you talk about it in the book as well, is that mental clarity that you have once you've made that switch, you almost think to yourself, why didn't I do this before? Like, why wasn't right. they think, why don't they tell us these things? But like you said, it's not in their interest because they, these tech companies are there to distract you and do these things. But I think there is such a thing as a healthy relationship with them and it's finding what that balance yeah. is and what that can, because you can be one of those people that are, you said it well to say that pros and cons, you can be one of those people that says, you know, all the social media, put everything you have online. Uh, as someone who's a creative and someone who puts content out, I don't put anything re regarding me as an individual person. Like I don't put up selfies. I don't put up what I do in a day to day. Life. Like one who cares because there's <laughs> <laughs> who actually cares. But another thing is, what value is that giving the person that's watching it? Yes. You know, some people might be interested. Um, I would really counter those people and say, why are you interested? But right. some, people, some people might be interested and it's yeah. what value you're giving, not only to the people, but yourself, because what I've found is as of someone who is a creative and putting work out there is you don't want to give all the value just to the individual person that's watching it. There has to be some value in it for you, not only just because of, you know, comments or views or whatever that be, but that content has to have value for you as well. Um, and I think that's something that people struggle with, especially when they create content or write a book, like you say, it has to be as valuable uh, to you as the individual, as you know, the person that's prospective to read it. So I think that's a really important point. Uh, I think uh, we've kind of gone slightly overboard because we've been having a, have a really interesting <laughs> conversation, but something I really wanted to talk about was uh, towards the end of the book is I talked about it. Uh, we talked about it briefly was the bibliography. So the first thing that mm -hmm. I do with most books is I go straight to the end and I have a look at, oh, I like that. I have a look at the books that they've referenced. Cause I think then you get a bit more flavor for the book um, because, you know, I read a lot and there are some books that I feel like stand out. And the thing I liked about yours as well is that you noted it by chapter. I think some people just go bibliography for the whole thing, but I think it's nice to say, this is what this was. And you can kind of track the book by the mm -hmm. arguments and the, and the books at the back, you're like, okay, he talked yeah. about this concept. I really enjoyed that. Okay. That's that book. So in the book, you talk a lot about, you know, in, in this conversation, we've talked a lot about Cal Newport and deep work, Stephen Pressfield, you know, Dan Harris and his book, 10% happier. When you were writing this book, what was apart from those books or, or, or if in, including those books, what was the ones for you that really cemented the idea of reframe the day or really, gave you the impetus to continue writing when it was difficult and, and which books were the main sources of, of inspiration for it? Yeah. So I think, and this actually ties into something you were mentioning at the end there about, you know, going on a full on digital hiatus when you were, mm -hmm. you know, working on your dissertation. And one of the things I've been thinking about a lot recently and through some of the books that I've been reading recently, like Nicholas Carr's The Shallows is this idea that, the medium through which we consume technology and through which we create content, you know, literally affects how our brain works. It literally changes the way our mind operates and, you know, different connections are going to be made differently in your brain. If you're reading something versus taking in, you know, a Twitter feed all day long. And so one of the things that I've been thinking about is because I get so much value from reading, maybe that is not just, from the content that's in the books themselves, but the process of reading and the work it takes to go into what Carr calls deep reading. And 
the way that ideas start to to fuse or start to just pop into your consciousness when Mm -hmm. you are three hours into a good book instead of three hours into a social media binge or something. And so that's what I've been thinking about a lot recently. And I think that ties into this question because broadly the value that I have gotten through all of the practices in my book have come from not just my own experience, but from the books that I've read. And a lot of them are cited in there. There's like some 200, 250 footnotes or something Mm -hmm. or end notes, but those come from, you know, those are a small subsection of the podcasts I've listened to the books that I've read conversations I've had with people. So broadly the act of reading itself has probably been the most valuable single thing I've done um, to in terms of bringing those ideas in the book into my awareness in the first place, and then into my consciousness in a way that I could connect different ideas Mm. and tie them all together. The reason I start with the chapter on, you know, creating stillness and building awareness. Those are the first two chapters is because the, you know, the sense of awareness is kind of the prerequisite for everything else that comes later in the book. You know, you have to be aware of the things that bring you value. You have to be aware of, the way that thoughts and emotions cascade into our minds and hijack what we're doing and how we think and how we feel. And we have to be aware of what adds value to our lives and what we're just doing because we're insecure about our place in a particular working environment or something like that. So awareness is the prerequisite for all of it. But broadly, the act of reading books, for me, it's mostly Kindle, but I've tried to reintroduce a little bit of print into my life as well. But the act of reading books is probably fundamentally the thing that has shaped reframe the day more than anything else. Um, more specifically, you know, we talked about deep work in terms of how I think about how I spend my time. That's certainly been the most influential book that I have read certainly in the last few years. I think this book that I just mentioned, the shallows by Nicholas Carr, I think, you know, I'm still processing it. I'm going to write something about it in the next few weeks. Just finished it a couple of weeks ago. I heard about it first on Ezra Klein's podcast. Um, you know, I think that's this, I have the feeling that this is one of those books that's going to stick with me for a really long time. Um, there are a few books that I, I cite in my book. You know, I have, I talk about Brian Stevenson's book, Just Mercy, which recently was made into a movie. Um, you know, that in terms of what it means to be a human being and to experience pain and to keep moving forward, just on top of the systemic historic issues that Stevenson talks about, about America, but about human beings in general, that's probably one of the most transformative um, books that I've ever read. So the two books, Deep Work and Just Mercy, are by far the books that I recommend the most. Um, A few others that, you know, you mentioned Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art and this idea of resistance. And this is another one of those concepts that when it is made tangible in the form of seeing it on the page in front of you, Mm -hmm. it can be almost a relief because it's this thing that we all feel that, we didn't know was a thing. We didn't know anybody else felt until we found it in a book. And so just for those who are not aware, Pressfield's concept of the resistance is just this feeling that is what keeps you from starting the things you care most about. And so, you know, for you and me, it might be recording a video or writing an article or something like that. It's the things that we want to be doing that fulfills us, but for whatever reason, we just don't start. Resistance is that force, you know, in between us and the work that we want to do. Um, it's sort of, I guess, like procrastination, but it's more insidious Mm. and it's deeper than that. But the way that he talks about it not only helps us recognize when we're feeling the resistance, but knowing that we feel resistance towards starting something is often a pretty good sign that it's something that we care about. So I think that book, you know, it's what, 100 pages, 150 pages? It's very short, but it's, that's certainly been transformative. And then Mm -hmm. there's a lot of, I cite a lot of biographies of U.S. presidents in the book. And I like learning about history through biography. I think that's a really interesting way to read a good story, but also, you know, learn about our place in the world and also to give us some perspective on the fact that there's nothing that we're encountering in our lives right now. Specifically, yes, it's new and unprecedented, but broadly, this, you know, human beings do the same things over Mm -hmm. and over again we face the same challenges Mm -hmm. we're confronted with the same issues and there's a lot that we can learn from looking to the past and so you know the work of ryan holiday and other authors to bring stoicism sort of back into the mainstream 
conversation, at least in this self-improvement space. I've, I've gained a lot from Definitely. reading what he says and what, you know, he talks about in the daily stoic and a few of his other books. Um, so I'm trying to think if there's anything else I should mention. I think you there, know, the last thing any, I should say. Is, okay, go for it. So the last thing I should say is that, you know, just books on meditation for me have been, have served as, besides introducing me to the practice of mindfulness meditation, have also served for me as sort of a mini meditation in and of themselves. Mm. And I think that's true for a lot of practices that we're trying to develop. I think it's important that we don't just read something or listen to something and say, I'm going to start doing that and think that reading about it or listening to it is the same thing as doing it. Um, I've made that mistake many times before, Mm. you know, go on vacation, read a good book, feel super inspired to change my life and implement all these new habits and think that having read about it, I've basically done it. But in fact, I've just started thinking about it. Um, So recognizing that, but at the same time, if you're on a mindfulness journey or you're on a journey to become a reader or a writer, reading about other people going through that same journey Mm. can be a very, you know, helpful self reinforcement for that practice itself. How much do you, do you integrate fiction at all into your, into your reading materials? I'm very glad that you asked that because that's, that was actually something that I committed to working on this year and have started to do a lot more. And it's funny funny because it's exactly the same thing that I've done. I made a commitment this year. Like I'm currently reading uh, notes from the underground by Fyodor Dostoevsky. So I'm trying to read books that are fiction related, but talk about psychological tendencies and have historical reference. Cause I'm like you, I love reading about history because there was this uh, Churchill quote that says the only thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing at all. And <laughs> for, for me, right. it's, it's really important to understand like the things that we're experiencing right now have been experienced before. You just have to go and find the solution. The solution's there in the past. You just have to go find it. And I think that's really important. Yeah. So, Yeah, that's so great. And I, I think there's, I mean, the reason I didn't read fiction before is because I sort of wrongly convinced myself that the only way I would learn something. The only way I would gain knowledge was by reading nonfiction. And in part, I think that reflects a tendency that I've had for a long time to think that, you know, I can, and I talk about this in the book, like that I don't need to feel feelings, that vulnerability, insecurity, anxiety, all these human emotions that other human beings are wrestling with, I don't need to feel those and I'll be more productive. I'll get Mm -hmm. more done if I just bury those. And so part of my journey of recognizing that uh, feelings are going to happen one way or the other a and b they make life a lot richer and a lot more you know beautiful and unique and human Mm. so part of that journey for me is recognizing that i have a lot to learn about what it means to be human too and i don't think there's other than living life and talking to other human beings like there's no better way to learn that than through fiction than through being in the mind of one or more characters in addition to the author and learning about empathy and learning about other journeys. And there's, you know, on top of that, there's a whole lot that we can learn about history. And like you said, psychology and all these other things that we learn about in nonfiction, we can learn about those in reading novels as well, in addition to just gaining a broader understanding of the human condition in general. And so it's still a balance. I still feel sometimes a little bit guilty for reading a novel. And I think that's something I'm working on, Mm -hmm. kind of working out of my system that that way I've sort of trained myself to see that if, you know, nonfiction is work, fiction is a guilty pleasure or something. And uh, so that's, that's a journey that I'm on of kind of working that out of how I think about the world. And it's what it's it, obviously the same with nonfiction. It depends what the fiction is. I mean, you're not going to read like a teen thriller or anything like that, right. because <laughs> it's just, there's not going to add anything, but it's being selective on what type of fiction it is. I think that's really important as well. And it's interesting that you're trying yeah. to build that in as well, because it's not only the story and the, and the things that you can learn about the emotions of vulnerability is the ability to storytell. Like we were saying before, it's how can I use, or or we use these ways in which to tell stories to implement in our own writings and the way in which we tell our own stories. Because sometimes when I read a really good fiction piece, I'm like, you look back and and you almost feel like really surprised about the way it's um, the the story's unfolded. And you're like, how did the writer and author do this? And you kind of think to yourself, how can I implement this ability to storytell in my own writings, which I think, um, my favorite nonfiction writers actually are ones in which tell stories in a way that's mm-hmm. engaging and informative, but isn't like, I, do, I really don't like books that are somewhat academic where they kind of just blurt the information out and it almost feels too like a scientific journal more than something that should be actually consumed as a book. 
And I think fiction does that really yeah. well. And it's definitely something that we can learn more from. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you're saying this because you have such a big platform in this bookstagram and book space more broadly that I think focuses, there seems to be, you know, I was new to the bookstagram world before I, I left it, you know, after just a few months, but yeah. it seemed to me like there was a bit of a divide between folks who were talking about nonfiction and self-improvement mm. and folks who were talking about fiction and being able to bridge that divide. Like there's a huge opportunity there to, to reach a lot more people and to bring new voices and experiences to people who would otherwise perhaps not be open to them or to be like you and I were, you know, a few years ago and very closed off to the idea of fiction maybe. Mm. Yeah. And I think it's the idea that I think, well, I think we'll probably wrap it up here, but it's that idea of being open-minded to the things that you can read and the possibilities. And I think there's something yeah. that can be learned in every opportunity and it's just being self-aware to how that can happen to you and how that can be related to you, which closes in nicely with the idea of your book, which is <laughs> <laughs> uh, creating a, a, better, a better perspective. Well, thank you on, uh, on, on creating, you know, a framework and, and reframing your day in a way, which, you know, makes you live a more fulfilling life. So Thank you very much, Adam. That was a great conversation and I thoroughly yeah, loved it. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, where can people find you? You know, we, we were discussing, you know, about your blog and, and obviously the book. Where, where's the best place to find you at the moment? So the best place is my website, adaml.blog, A-D-A-M-L dot B-L-O-G. And you can find more about the book, links to pick it up wherever you get your books on the internet. The book is Reframe the Day, Embracing the Craft of Life One Day at a Time. So adaml.blog, you can sign up for my newsletter there. If you want to check out the book, you can sign up for the newsletter. You'll get the first three chapters for mm. free. Um, I'm writing pretty regularly about politics, about life, about a lot of the stuff we've talked about, you know, time blocking, how the medium of what we read and consume affects how we read and consume. So all of these things I'm kind of exploring as I go out loud. That's what my newsletter reframe or inbox is about. And then that would be the place to go. And the last thing I'll mention again is, you know, what you kindly added in earlier on, which is that the author profits from sales of Reframe the Day go to Direct Relief, the COVID-19 response efforts of that organization. So folks can know that, you know, buying this book will hopefully be good for you as an individual. Hopefully you'll get some value out of it. But at the very least, you know that the money that would be going to me is actually going to the COVID-19 response efforts of Direct Relief. So all of that and more on my website, adaml.blog. Adam, thank you very much. I definitely- Thanks on, this was great. I definitely recommend the newsletter, by the way. Uh, I signed up <laughs> uh, a couple of weeks ago. And like we said, I mentioned in here, I think it's full of great information and I think people uh, will get a lot of value out of it. So thank you very much. It was, uh, it was great to have you on and I look forward to uh, speaking again uh, soon, definitely. Yeah, I hope so. Thanks on. Great, thank you.